Find the seat. Find the seat. Sit down. Find the seat. You know what they have to Hey, look, we're going to have Al's presentation. If you've got to have a conversation, please leave the room. I'm serious, right? We have our presenters. They go out of their way to, to give us a show, all right? To give us an education, in essence. I do appreciate them doing this. So please, if you have to have a conversation, you got a phone call or something, leave the room. That's the only uh, courteous thing to do. All right. So we're going to learn about Reggie Fassenden. Al Clay, step right up. The, the, the last while back, I've been working on the wireless era stuff in front of the museum. <laughs> Every time you turn around when you're researching this stuff, you run into Fessenden, Fessenden, Fessenden. Well, okay, let's, let's see if we can figure this out. And it kind of turns out he did everything, and he did it all at once. And, and so it's been, it's been weighing on my brain to, to put this together in some way that we can present it. Um, 1866, uh, his wave, radio, he's pretty tall, Telegraph in 1906. And uh, there's the legendary uh, Christmas 1906 AM broadcast. Uh, I was born in Canada, and uh, I, I guess to, to say that he was uh, uh, precocious is, is kind of uh, to tell you graduated from college at the age of 14. Bring the mic over here. Okay, that'll work. I'll work from here. And that's the other school next year. And uh, you know, the rest of this Whitney Institute thing in Bermuda. And uh, then we'll kind of get into radio. Uh, New York? Yeah, we're New York. 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 Okay, you got, you got to consider how bad I've been hyping up. Okay, move to New York. Uh, actually, to work for Edison in West Park. Ends up in the hemisphere. And he's working on one line of vision. I think that means he needs, but <laughs> the whole story there. Chairman of the EE Department of Western University of Pennsylvania. That ultimately becomes the, the city of, of Pittsburgh. Uh, he was personally recruited by George Westinghouse of Westinghouse Electric fame. So, the, the internet of the 1900s was, was telegraph. And our buddy Marconi says, well, let's get rid of the wires and we'll transmit a receiver through the telegraph. A uh, little more detail on Marconi. He had an induction coil, Rumkoff coil. It was a buzzer box. He said, hi, little Jason. He didn't even bother with tuning the antenna. On the receiver end, you have a thing called a coherer, which has a little pile of filings in it. When a radio wave comes around, long files get the head crunch up, and now they conduct DC. But they stay conducting DC, so you only get to remember that one pulse came by. So what you do, you have a a real down that hammers the thing, and now you're ready to receive it. So, so the guy keeps the guy keeps the transmitter, and and the receiver rattles like a buzzer. So that was it. And Fessenden is watching this. And here's, here's Marconi's station, so you just got a feel for this big old coil. His secret was more or less secret. Uh, and the output was a motor, and it wasn't a relay, so you could uh, do whatever you want. You have enough, enough uh, electricity for that. Here's this key, which is kind of interesting. The, this is a transmit receive switch. The antenna comes down here, up here, and you switch over to the receiver. 
uh, and when you go to transit, you uh, you need to have rooms that any system detail for you. That's working out awfully. It's kind of interesting. It's trying to out. The out structure is not just the bar, but here, that's in the list. It's, a, it's an analog of electrical analog of a mass of a compliance and pressure is waiting on the string. And that's, that's how you're generating the signals. And so the output of these things, each spark gets you a pulse of energy, a so called damp wave. They fall off like this. That's high end because the receiver end gets here the frequency of the original spark. So that's helpful. But when you look at this thing in actually it's uh, individual signals spaced out at the spark in the whole time, wasting a lot of energy and trying to run two of these in the same neighborhood hmm. proves to be a big problem. So there's a lot of improvements to be made in radio. Not that far. So back around 1897, right after Marconi, Kessenden's thinking about this, and he says, well, here's the telephone, a lot like the telegraph circuit. You have current coming around this way, except over here, instead of a key, you have a very specific microphone, which the analog changes in the current. So he says, wireless telephone. But it took me too long to figure out that this buzzing transmitter isn't going to do the deal for them. You're not going to be able to hear through the buzz. And of course, the uh, the coherer receiver isn't going to uh, And so what he's really saying is, let's let's take the transmitter, let's put the carbon bike in series with it, and, and let's go on the air. So, he re but he realizes that the spark transmitter isn't, isn't going to do it. And he thinks about it, and he's the one to come up with, I don't need a damp wave. I need a continuous wave. Mm -hmm. And so, 1897 or so, in Fessenden's mind, the pipeline for a source of continuous wave via frequency energy. Uh, continuous wave, of course, looks like that. And it's that bandwidth wise, which is one single frequency. Uh, these things came from spice simulations that I did when I needed some of these graphics. And that was interesting because the spice simulation, I knew about what I was going to do the, uh, the, the inherent distortion in whatever I was doing. So, uh, and of course, you have to modulate it with sidebands. And uh, that's what he's trying to do. He no, I kind of mix things in here. It all happens at once. And it's a little hard to understand if you don't you know, get some of the underlying principles. So, he's like, well, we see how you transmitters, continuous wave transmitters. And somebody asked him, well, how do you how do you do this? He says, well, take a high frequency alternator, connect it to an antenna, and tune for maximum output. Well, that's exactly what he did. Yes, sir. Including John Ambrose Levin, Levin Valve fame, maintaining that continuous AC of an antenna would not really be needed that way the signals come off. Mm -hmm. These guys didn't understand what Maxwell was trying to tell them. So that's where that's where it went out. signal my best headset, but a 2.7 volt signal hurts my ears. Well, what does that really mean? And this goes back to Alexander Graham Bell before he invented the telephone. He was studying hearing, and he realized the response of the ear is 
is logarithmic. So we end up with the concept of death of wealth per bells, which is whole orders of magnitude, 10, 100, 1,000, which is kind of big steps. So you do a test of that. Decibel is calculated as 10 times the log of a power ratio if you got one watt, 10 watts. Or you can do it in voltage, it's 20 times the log. And now a couple of stakes in the ground here. Uh, we also, also, in a lot of cases, uh, decibels are relative. In some cases, they're absolute because they're referring to a, a reference level with the EDM is a lot, as relative to one milliwatt. The stakes in the ground about decibels. If you're listening to an audio tone, a 1 dB change is just about middle here. A 3 dB change, which is half the power or twice the power, is just a noticeable change. 6 dB is, the, is twice the voltage. 10 dB is 10 times the power. If somebody tells you to turn up the radio, you'll turn it up about 12, 10 dB and see if that's enough. 20 dB is 100 so far on here. So uh, I'll, I'll be talking decibels here a little bit. Go to sequence of Morse code. They were very simple. I was like, by slide, by 20 dB, maybe minus 30. But the telephone guys knew. You take a telephone receiver, one milliwatt, zero dBm, is really loud. In fact, that's a standard reference level even today for telephones. Minus 30 is still an easily readable signal. And minus 60, way on down there, is still and that's, So let's find a way to use headphones in our radio receivers to increase sensitivity. But you connect the headphones to RF, you don't hear. So what, what to do? Now here's, here's the deal. You take your coherer receiver, you forget about all the other stuff over here, you put the phone to it. Well, lo and behold, sometimes if you had a real strong signal, you could hear it anyway. Because these little guys in here, they call them imperfect contact detectors. Okay, and so uh, an example of that, and, and they called them auto coherers because you didn't have to hammer on these things. Uh, and, and one of the ones I like, the so called Italian Navy coherer, which uh, was initially attributed to a guy named Castelli. But uh, have you heard of, of Chandra Bose, Indian radio scientist? He, he invented this. In, 1899, little known little guy. But what it is, uh, it is two iron plugs with a ball of mercury in the middle of it. This one had, I think, a, 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 an iron plug and a uh, maybe copper with, with carbon granules in between. And this is the kind of uh, detector that Tony used to get to you know, to. Uh, jumping sort of my ball. This graph is what's known as a transfer function. You're feeding some current into it and watching the voltage come out of it, like this circuit down here. If that component is a resistor, the output is a straight line. That's why it's called linear. Uh, and so if we put a sine wave into this thing, we'll find out we get a sine wave out of it. Let's suppose the line isn't a straight line, like a diode. It only conducts when the current goes positive after it's come up from zero a little bit. It doesn't conduct over So now, if we feed our sine wave in there, gee, it's been rectified. We only get positive and coming out. And you all the escalator detectors, and yeah, you get all these half sine waves, and then you average them out. You've got something you can hear in the headset. But let's take a let's take a different look at that. The difference between linear and nonlinear, and also 
capacitors and inductors are linear components as well as resistors. So if we feed our sine wave with <coughs> one frequency into a linear circuit, we get a sine wave out. It might be phase shifted. Its amplitude might change due to the frequency response of the thing. But there's only one frequency that comes out of the linear circuit. Nonlinear circuits, like let's say a sine wave goes in here, it comes out looking like this. Well, instead of just one frequency coming out, you get a plethora of them. And the other thing that happens is if we were to put two sine waves in here, you would get modulation products down here. And we'll talk about beat notes and heterodynes in a little bit here, which is where Fesselman comes in on this. Now, of course, nobody knew this at that point. So the heterodyne principle. Uh, does, does the word beat notes mean something to people? We got musicians and piano tuners and whatnot. Yeah, two and two dissimilar <coughs> frequencies, and you hear the difference frequency between them. Uh, Fessenden coined the word heterodyne from the Greek, meaning different forces. He filed a patent in 1902 uh, called wireless signaling, where he was using heterodynes to, uh, to detect radio signals. Now, uh, jumping a little ahead here, uh, this is a, a poster I did for the museum. And like it says here, it's the old frequency changing trick. And so you have some continuous wave signal up here, keyed in Morse. I think it's set at CQ, 100 kilohertz. You run that into your diode detector, and what you get is DC keyed off on and off down here. Maybe if you're lucky, you'll hear key clicks in your headset if it's really, <coughs> really strong. But it's not an acceptable detector. So what you do, and you've probably looked at short wave